behind my desk for my first exam of my new studies. It's a pandemic, so we're using online exam software that surveys students to check if they are cheating or not. We call this proctoring. I sit behind my desk, I log in, met my name, Robin Aisha Pokorny, and my password, welcome123, exclamation. <laughs> and it has a facial detection step. So I sit in front of the camera and I wait for it to count, and, I, and it counts one, two, three, smile, takes a picture and it tells me, face not found, room too dark, which is interesting because it's broad daylight out and I'm in a well-lit room. So I'll try again because we only get 15 minutes to log in and after these 15 minutes, we are barred from the exam. So you have to log in on time and I sit there again and it, I sit one, two, three, smile. And again, it tells me face not found, room too dark. And in the darkest of times, we must create light. So that's what I do. I grab a lamp and I just shine it bright in my face. And I one, two, three, smile, and bam, it works. I get into my exam. So after the exam, I go on the student Discord channel. This is basically a forum where we talk about our experiences as students. And on there, a lot of students are explaining that this the software doesn't work for them. They hate it, it's very invasive, but none of them are talking about what I have experienced. Face not found, room too dark. So I do what any smart person would do. I go on Google and I find many articles about students that have the same problem as me. They have to use a light in their face. They have to stand closer to the light source, stand on a table, find alternative test taking technologies, alternatives to take their exams. And what's interesting is that none of the students that I find in this article are white. It only applies to black students and students of color. So I go with this to my teachers and I say, hey, I don't think it's face not found. I think it's face too black. And my teachers are like, go to the frequently asked question page of the developer of the software. Maybe you can find your answer there. And unfortunately, that's a dead end for me. So I go to the student advisory office and I ask them, hey, is there an alternative for me to take my exams that doesn't include using this software? But there isn't, unfortunately. And I become a little bit unsettled because where do I report this to? And meanwhile, more, as more articles are coming out about students with these problems, I am not the only one. So maybe I'm still conducting my exams with my light in my face. I'm not the only one. So maybe I should um, find a way to, to, to report this to the university. But the most important part first is to explain how AI works. So artificial intelligence uh, is a way to find, um, it's a way to predict, oh, sorry, my guys. <laughs> Art Thank you. Artificial intelligence are computer systems that, that mimic human behavior. But in order to do that, we have to train it. And I am going to explain how artificial intelligence works with the best example that I know. And I love comics and superheroes. And I usually go to comic conventions dressed up as my favorite superhero. <laughs> we call this cosplay. And let's say that we make an AI. We call it Stanley. Nerds know. And AI, this AI, Stanley, is supposed to predict what superhero you're wearing based on a picture of you in your superhero cosplay outfit. And basically what we do, we train it with all these features, capes, crowns, armor, and it show, and eventually Stanley will learn how, um, how, what you're wearing, what superhero, which superhero you're representing. That could be Superman or Iron Man or the Hulk, and eventually it's be able to, it will be able to differentiate between those superheroes. But what if Stanley is only fed with Superman images? It will never be able to predict what Spider-Man looks like. And this is also what happens when facial detection software is only fed with white faces. It will struggle to detect black faces at the same rate as it does the white 
faces in training. And that means a human face is not found because these people are still human. And this is not something that has, is new. And this is not something that, is, that has only arised in, during the pandemic. People have been talking about this for years, such as Dr. Buolimwini, about racism in technology. And these type of wrongful predictions can have detrimental effects, such as not being able to wash your hands because your black hand is not detected by a soap dispenser, to being falsely accused of a crime, to being run over by a car because it cannot detect you as a person. This is distress, disastrous. And for me, I'm still conducting my exams with a light in my face, and I am still in the middle of the pandemic, but it's also, my birthday. I'm turning 25, it's 2021, it's the summer, and COVID is still rampant around the world, and you know where else it's rampant? In my body, because on my 25th birthday, I was in my bed with COVID. And on my birthday, an article gets published, an opinion piece in one of the Dutch newspapers by the Amsterdam-based Knowledge Center, Racism and Technology Center, and it reads, University of Amsterdam, do not disguise racism in proctoring with beautiful words. And this is them calling out the university for the use of racist proctoring in, in education, which is with disadvantages black students and students of color. And I know one of the authors, Hans de Swart, so I text him and a text leads to a meeting with the Racism and Technology Center and the other founders, Naomi Oppermann and Jill Toe, and we go together to file a case in the university because we want to do something right. And so I am a computer scientist and not everybody knows how these untransparent and very invisible discriminate, types of discrimination work, and I thought it was important to highlight this. So we go to the ombudsman at the university and we ask her, hey, where can we file a case? And she says, sorry, I cannot help you because your problem was with not with a person, but with a technological system. And this means that this is beyond my jurisdiction. So our next option is to go to the big shots. We file a letter at the board of directors, at the exam commission, and again, the ombudsman, because she has to know too. And eventually this works. We get to go into a room with the educational office heads at the science faculty. And at this point, I have three claims. I want the university to ditch the software immediately. I want them to apologize to all students who have been affected by this software. And I want them to vet algorithms before they are acquired by the university. And unfortunately, the university says, sorry, we will not be processing your complaint because you're the only student who has come into our office with this problem and you were able to log in with, within the 15 minutes. So can't really do anything about that, but we're sorry for your experience. So I go to the Dutch Human Rights Institute because the fight is not over. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> so I go to the Dutch Human Rights Institute, which is an independent human rights institute in the Netherlands. And I file this case and the floodgates open and I suddenly become the algorithmic discrimination girl. I am in the newspaper with Hans, I'm on TV, I'm doing magazine interviews with Naomi, nationally and internationally. And we're going to a hearing and I bring my lamp to the hearing. And I did, I brought the lamp to the hearing and to show them, you know, with the thing that I was having to deal with. And in December of 2022, Two years after my first experience with the software, the, in, the Dutch Human Rights Institute judges that has an interim judgment. And in this interim judgment states that I have provided enough evidence to highly suspect algorithmic discrimination by the use of this software. And this is a huge feat because with this, I become the first person in the Netherlands to create case law around algorithmic discrimination. <laughs> But guess what? The fight is still not over because it's an interim judgment and not the final verdict. 
And we are, the, it's now the university's job to show that the algorithm did not discriminate. So we go through a bunch of counter evidence, replies, counter evidence for a while. And I'm sitting at a table with three other people anxiously waiting for a phone call. I'm actually preparing my TEDx talk with these people and my phone rings and uh, it's the final verdict day. So I'm getting to know whether I won this case or not. The phone rings, I pick up and we lost. We lost because the definition of the court for discrimination was the amount of minutes it took me to log in and not the conditions in which I had to. This means that I, for this court, was not discriminated against by the use of this software. But I don't only want to talk about the losses. I also, you know, I'm standing here on a TEDx stage, I have to inspire or whatever. So I'm going to say something inspiring and you're all going to be like, oh, Okay, so. <laughs> what did we gain? We gained a lot of knowledge. Algorithms are not intelligent. They're human-made, and they include human biases and faults, which can have detrimental effects on people of color, black people, trans people, queer people, and anyone who doesn't look white. On top of that, this, just because we can, doesn't mean we have to. Just because we can implement algorithms in universities doesn't mean we have to do this and survey students in their own homes without their consent. And on top of that, what can you do? Make sure that we demand justice and demand transparency from the people who implement these systems and the people who create them because it is up to us to decide how these human implementations do not result in human faults. So together, let us all work for a more just technological space without barriers to entry. Just one, two, three, smile. <laughs>